call at 574-91-FM and keep your radio tuned right here to KCSM for People, next with Claire Mack. Good afternoon to you. This is Claire Mack. Welcome to People. I am very, very pleased to be here with you today. I'm, I'm, ple I'm pleased to um, see distinguished visitors from the IRS in the audience today for our, uh, our special guest lecture by a man who needs no introduction, Professor Jeff Allman. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I gather some of you uh, noticed the title of the lecture, and it it's really was... Uh, uh, just an application of, I guess, what is a good um, principle of cover design, which is you attract people with something that's not in the book. And uh, uh, okay, I, I really, I guess, I, I did want to spend uh, ten or fifteen minutes uh, talking about the financial aspects of book writing, and, and in particular, just sort of how the money flows. Um, but then I, I wanted to, well, I guess, sort of talk about some of the things I like and some of the things I don't like, and. and just sort of harangue you folks uh, a bit about a, a random collection of topics. Uh, and if I have time, uh, I will talk at the end about um, sort of facing the competition in, in the book writing industry, and, and in particular, uh, the uh, uses and misuses of plagiarism. Um, OK. Um, anyway, first of all, okay, what, what is a book? Uh, in, its, in its most general form, it's, it's a megabyte of text, okay? Um, uh, okay, now, I find that I've trained myself to write uh, on the average about two or three thousand bytes per hour, okay? Um, now, that doesn't count uh, any of the preparation of learning the material. Just once I know what I need to know to write something, uh, I can generally put together the necessary examples and just, just, you know, just get the ideas down on text at a rate of about, say, say 3,000 uh, characters per hour uh, for the first, uh, the first draft. Um, uh, I, I think you can if you don't already, you can probably train yourself to write at about that speed. Uh, I've been unable to, to do any better uh, uh, despite years of, of uh, practice. Okay. No? Uh, I assume you're just talking about first drafting there? Yeah, I'm talking about the first draft. Now, okay, now I want to factor in, okay, you've got to actually read what you've written, you've got to punch it up, you've got to write, a, um, make bibliographic notes and an index and whatnot. Uh, 
you've got to have it refereed and you have to respond to the referee's comments, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I figure that the best you can do is write about one kilobyte per hour of, of finished text. So what does that tell us? It says you need about 1,000 hours to write a book. Okay? Now that's not too much. Okay? At, at eight hours a day, that's 200 days, or a little bit less than a working year. Um, okay, now, okay, let, 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 let's, let's I, I just want to say a few words about what happens to the money. Okay, you go, you go find a publisher, uh, the publisher uh, prints up the book and tries to sell as many copies as the publisher can. Um, okay, now let's see, if, if I could have the, the overhead on the pad for a second. Uh, okay, so the way, okay, so a, a thousand hours equals one book. Okay, now, the publisher publishes the, the thing and uh, oh, these days perhaps forty dollars is the price of, uh, list price of a book. Now, what happens um, to the forty dollars that the public, well, that the, the bookseller receives. Well, there are two cases. We've got domestic and foreign sales. Okay, uh, in a domestic sale, that's typically a textbook market. It's you know the book is sent to the, the Stanford bookstore, bookstore which sells it at, at list or, or a little bit less. Um, you're going to get well roughly. 75% to the publisher, okay. uh, and that's a fairly low markup. I mean, uh, if this were a shirt sold at Macy's, this figure would be more like 50%. Uh, uh, this ver it's been this figure has been going down, by the way. Okay, maybe tw uh, 72 or 73% is a, a fairer amount, but that's roughly it. So, in other words, the publisher receives $30. Right? Now, uh, a typical contract. Uh, might call for a 15 percent royalty. Okay, so that means to the author, uh, you've got four dollars and fifty cents. Okay, now um, let's look at the foreign sale. Okay, well first of all, in the foreign sales, they generally give you a, a lower royalty rate. Uh, okay, but they do something. I mean, again, this is typical. Not every publisher does this, but. Um, Typically, um, uh, they will sell it at 55% of list to a foreign subsidiary. Okay, it's a, a purely internal transaction that has impact on your royalty rate. Okay, uh, so we're talking now about $22. Okay, and then maybe you'll get a 10% royalty. And uh, what does that make? I guess that's two dollars and twenty cents. Okay. Now, um, okay. What does a typical book sell <coughs> over its lifetime? Well, it's sometimes hard. It's it's hard to. Uh, the average figure is probably not the typical figure. I think if you've written either a really good book in a specialized topic or a mediocre book in um, in a more general topic, uh, then uh, you might expect to sell maybe 1,500 domestic copies and maybe 500 foreign copies. Yeah, that's over the lifetime of the book, or over five years, say. Uh, well, if you um, work it out, it's uh, I've got it, 6750 plus $1,100, so it's about $8,000. Okay. Now, take a look at that. Looks like you make eight dollars an hour. Okay. So, okay. Now that I'm not not to say that you don't necessarily want to write a book. There are there are lots of factors, uh, especially the impact your book has on the field, uh, driving research forward, and so on. Okay. Um, I'm not going to even attempt to address uh, the non-financial uh, reasons for writing a book. Okay. What I do want to address, though, is um, what uh, you know. What do you really have to do to make book writing uh, a, a a going proposition, something that is actually worth your time? 
okay, purely for the, the process of writing a book. Now, I want to always remember that I'm excluding the time it takes for you to learn your subject. I assume that's something that, that you do want to do anyway, and you shouldn't charge the time in the library reading uh, research papers to uh, the cost of writing a book. Um, okay, first of all, uh, number one point is you want to double that royalty rate. Okay, and uh, I don't want to discuss this in the class, but I will be happy to discuss offline how you double the royalty rate. It's quite feasible to get instead of 15%, a 30% rate. Um, the second uh, thing you want to do is you want to target your, your, your book for about 10,000 sales rather than 2,000 sales. I guess really, I mean 10,000 domestic sales. That's 2,000 uh, copies per year over five years. Uh, publishers are very, very happy to get a book that sells that well. Okay, most books that simply do not sell uh, that well. Um, on the other hand, uh, well, first of all, what happens if you can do that? Okay, uh, let, let's suppose that you can get a $10 royalty per domestic sale. That's maybe $9 per, per actual domestic sale plus a little bit more from the foreign sales. Um, Okay, you get $10 per copy now. If you sell 10,000 copies, you're making $100,000 for that uh, 100, for that 1,000 hours of work. That's $100 an hour. Okay, that's the rate of a medium grade hooker, and that's certainly not uh, less than we should aspire to, I think. Um, okay. Um, Okay, I, mean, I think that that's, that's sort of ballpark. You have to remember that that $100 per hour is paid to you three years after you did the work, so there's a uh, the interest cost and inflation cost that, that uh, chips away at that um, does not include uh, fringe benefits or overhead or anything like that. So it's, uh, it's not, $100 is not an unreasonable amount to ask for an hour writing a book. Um, okay, now, uh, if, you want, uh, if you want to sell 2,000 copies a year for five years, which I, again I'm suggesting should be your minimum target, um, well, Many areas of computer science, let's say compilers or operating systems, uh, the market is oh maybe 20 to 40,000 copies per year total. Okay. So that means you've got to shoot for five to 10 percent of the entire market. Okay, which means you've got to have, you don't have to have an earth-shattering book. Okay, it can be somewhat specialized or idiosyncratic. It's just got to find a niche. Okay, it's got to be either the most you know, the hardest book in the fields will be used at the best places, or the easiest books will be used at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, the next best places. I don't know. You know. Um, uh, but you know, it's not it's not off the wall to to contemplate writing a book in a mainstream subject of uh, you know sub area of computer science uh, that will capture ten percent of the market. Okay. Um, I, I might um, comment that. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to do in computer science uh, to expand the royalty rates is to discover that the typical computer science book has been selling much more than the typical book in random fields. Okay, now, and there's of course a lot of leverage in publishing. The publisher puts in a lot of investment um, uh, just to produce the uh, the Camaretti copy um, and and the other you know the other preparation. Um, Okay, there's a lot, they can afford to pay a lot more on a book that's going to sell 5,000 copies than they can on a book that will sell 2,000 copies. Moreover, in computer science, we have been, uh, you know, for a long time delivering our own camera ready copy, which really cuts down on the, uh, uh, the outlay that the publisher has to make. Um, and all these factors um, you know, have pushed uh, computer science royalty rates up above what they are in other fields. Now, I don't know how long that's going to last. I think enrollments in computer science are not going to go up forever. They are, in fact, probably going down. As the field matures, you have more people in the field writing books. Uh, the competition gets stiffer. The average sale per book goes down. Uh, my advice, if you're just starting out now, is probably get into some other field. Get into uh, biochemistry or, or, or something, or biogenetics. And where, in fact, where it's a young field, where you don't, where you have this 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 huge opening up of demand and uh, lack of book writing sophistication, and you know, go in there for for, for the big bucks. Um, okay, let's see. How many on the next page? Okay. Um, okay. I I'd, uh, I'd like uh, again. I just made a list of the kinds of things that 
make sense to me and the things that I try to pay attention to when I, when I write. Uh, well, uh, the first thing uh, is, I guess, uh, sort of a, a global strategy is, uh, I think it's very wise to work in a, in a team, uh, that is, uh, find yourself a co-author or two. Um, the, the reason is, is not, by the way, to cut that 1,000 hours of work down to 500 hours of work. You, you, you can't do that and you shouldn't do that. Okay, I find that I spend just as much time working on a co-authored book as I do on a, a book that I'm writing myself. Um, the big uh, advantage that you get is um, that having a co-author filters some of your own idiosyncrasy. At least I find this is very important to me. That when uh, I've written now, I guess, three books by myself and, and uh, maybe twice that with, with co-authors, I find that whenever I write by myself, um, my own craziness takes over and I, I, you know, I, I write something that's a dud. Uh, I think um, I, I wrote uh, oh, about 10 years ago a book called uh, Principles of Programming Systems, which basically nobody ever used. It was, I think, a very sound idea of trying to mix the theory and the basic uh, pragmatics of computer science into one introductory book. Um, but uh, again, I just I was just too weird, and and it it uh, it just never really sell, sold. It apparently, sells a lot of copies in Japan. It was translated into Japanese. I, I I have no idea what the significance of this is, but it sells now maybe five times as many copies in the Japanese edition as it does in the uh, English edition. Uh, I, I wrote a couple of years ago. I wrote a book on DLSI theory. Uh, same sort of problem. Uh, it looked like a really important topic to me, but but it. it Turned out, in fact, nobody really cares, and, and moreover, the selection of topics that I made was really kind of dumb, and, and again, the book you know, sort of fell flat. Uh, I think the only time I've been successful writing a book by myself was the, uh, the database book, which uh, actually has done pretty well. Uh, but there, you see, I had Chris Date's book as a model defining the market, and um, I was forced not to be my weird self. I, I sort of had to, you know, there's the sort, of the sort of necessary dose of reality that, um, that a co-author provides. Okay. Um, anyway, the, you know, the, the feeling that I get is that by bouncing things back and forth between yourself and a co-author or, or, or several co-authors, um, again, the, the, the worst and the most oddball stuff gets filtered out. And this has a a big effect on the quality of the book. Okay, not, it doesn't double the quality, whatever that means, but it makes it a little bit better. And the market is such that the best book gets most of the sales. There's a, a very, let's say, your, your impact is a, is a very nonlinear function of the quality of the book measured in some uh, sensible way. Uh, as, as a result, um, getting the quality up even a little bit uh, is worth sharing your royalties with a co-author. Right. I think it's just a, it's a net win all around by on any scale whatsoever. Whether you're thinking about royalties or or impact or just uh, you know quality, uh, any of these issues. Um, okay, next topic. Um, okay, I think I, I never found a book that had too many examples in it. I think one of the, um, uh, the big problems with books tends to be, in fact, that they have too few examples. Um, uh, I, um, uh, so I would, you know, I would advise you, in fact, whether you're writing a book or you're writing a technical paper, uh, you really get the ideas across with examples, not with, uh, not with the proofs and, and the, uh, the formal explanation. Uh, I, um, what I like to do um, is you start off with an example that is an over, you know, too simple but gets the key ideas across. For example, I, I brought in, so this is, this is uh, let's see, if we, again, if we have the overhead, this is uh, the tech book. Uh, it's the, I guess, the beginning of the section on, um, on macros. And uh, Don starts off with, sort of the simplest kind of macro you can imagine. Here's a, it says def and there's a, there's a name and there's a replacement text. 
Okay, and then there's an example of its use. Okay, and this gets across about 75% of the idea. Okay, now if you go a couple of pages further on, uh, you will find uh, an abstract example that uh, sort of gets the grubbies down. I, maybe it doesn't pay to go into this, but, but this is a, a completely off the wall uh, example that does explain many, many of the intricacies of how um, a macros work in TEF. Um, and so I, I guess I tend to favor this sort of an approach. You do something simple right up front, and then you give an example that works, uh, that uh, uh, an, an example that that really does expose the intricacies. Um, think, for example, if you were writing a book explaining how uh, the Gaussian elimination with pivoting works. Okay, I would suggest. Well, what 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 should you do to start? I mean, what, I mean, uh, yeah, right. How about two by two? Okay, just that gets seventy-five percent of the idea across. Okay, then work a three by three example where you need pivoting, and then in the first column, and then in the second column, you discover that in fact you have a singular matrix, and then the whole thing flies off the handle. I think that gets most of the uh, the grubby details of the idea across. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, I think it's, it's one of the, the trickiest things in writing a book, and unfortunately I don't have any prescription for it, is, uh, is how do you go about finding the example that exhibits the real problem, or exhibits the points that you want, all the points, and nothing but those points. Um, for example, um, if I wanted to illustrate the point that when you're doing, ra when you're doing insertions into a binary search tree, you could have a, a, a path, get a path of length n with n elements on it, I know how to work out you know, the right input that makes that happen. Um, but to do things that are, are harder, let's say, you know, even producing arbitrary shapes or just you know, uh, binary search trees with 10 examples of some funny subtree. Uh, I have no particular recipe for how you do that. It seems to me to be a very, just, a, you know, just a hard mathematical problem uh, coming up with the right example. Uh, I would suggest, though, that you spend lots and lots of time thinking about that. And again, that's true not only for book writing, but, but for technical paper writing. Uh, getting the right examples, the ones that illustrate all the points you want to illustrate and none that you don't, uh, is, is hard but very, very, very important. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, another thought uh, that I had is uh, it really helps if you put yourself in the position of the reader, okay, the, the user of your code, if you will, as you, um, uh, as you write. Um, I think that, um, again, this is something that doesn't really pertain to book writing in particular, but um, you really have to think what the impact of, of what you're writing is on, uh, on the person reading it. Um, for, uh, I, I find that it, you probably, best off to write your, uh, to write a section, uh, well, you spend the day learning the topic and you, in the evening, you write up your section on that topic. Um, that uh, you may not be as skilled in the subject as you will ever be if you've in fact just learned something, but, but you are, uh, in compensation, you remember exactly what the process was whereby you learned it and you should be able to say the right things that will help the reader to learn it. Okay. Um, another uh, thing which I see many, many times in books and technical papers that, that, uh, that always bothers me is uh, people think it's all right to put the definition down in section two and then in section five you come along and you use that definition and you expect people to have memorized everything you've written. I, I think that's just not the way readers work. If you're a reader, you will probably realize that. Um, so 
Um, I, the only prescription I have for that is basically, well, first of all, try to get definitions as close to their uses as possible, but also don't be ashamed to repeat things. Okay? If, for example, if you need section two to develop a, a set of definitions, and then the, some of those definitions wind up not being used until section five, there's no reason you shouldn't start out section five saying, uh, recall from section two that a foobar is a this and that. And, and just, just say it all over again. No problem with that. Well, very little problem anyway. Much better than the alternative. Um, need I mention that the object of writing a book or a technical paper, again, is not uh, to show how smart you are, but rather to uh, educate your reader. And uh, or, uh, the um, uh, one of I think one of the important aspects or you know applications of this point is that um, you have. To especially in, in book writing, you have to make a very careful uh, trade-off between using powerful mechanics that your reader may or may not uh, understand uh, and doing things in maybe a grubby, overlong, but simple or more basic uh, method. Uh, I was thinking, for, for example, when I wrote that DLSI book, I decided I needed to spend one little section on uh, a chip that would execute a probabilistic algorithm. Okay. Now, I had to ask myself, uh, is the reader likely to understand all of the mechanics that go along with the statistics or combinatorics uh, or asymptotic analysis? Uh, I decided no. Uh, so therefore, I have to either teach it on the spot, or I have to get around it some way. Okay, now I decided that since since the main uh, this was a rather peripheral topic, I didn't want to spend 20 pages teaching asymptotic analysis or statistics, and then five pages applying it. It just didn't make sense. Um, so what I, I contrived to do, and, and if anybody's interested, you can, you can read the, the relevant section, but um, was to, to use only very basic calculations, not trot out anything deep. Uh, and I, I worked fairly hard to get an elementary argument that proved just what I needed to prove and nothing more. Uh, again, that's, that's hard work, but I think it's, it's something that's uh, seriously worth considering. In other words, getting that, getting the level of your exposition down, uh, so that you can rely on your reader to understand, uh, w without either you having to explain the heavy-duty me mechanics or uh, asking the reader to go to some other book and get the mechanics. Um, okay, I have okay a couple. Of, this is sort of, I, I guess, the. Um, the strategy that I've been talking about. I have a couple of tactical remarks that I wanted to make. Um, uh, the, um, the first is I, I think people tend not to carry or, or state the types of variables uh, when they should. Uh, uh, for example, I, I'd much prefer to see you say the set S rather than just S even though everybody knows that S is a set. Okay. Um, I, I, well, let's see, I, I, brought, I, I found quite by accident uh, an example. I, I was going through Korth and Silvershots. I hate Korth and Silvershots books because I think they ripped me off. Uh, but so I was going, actually, I was going along, I was going looking for something else, and I, I came upon this example, which I'd, I'd, li I'd like to just sort of castigate them a small amount. Um, Okay, this is talking about voice cognomal form and I guess third normal form. Um, okay, well, let's, let me start off by saying something nice here. Okay, they say consider the scheme S equals blah, uh, which is at least they've typed S rather than just saying let S be that thing. And so I, I think that, that they get credit for that. I think if they had go, used a typesetting system that knew how to hyphenate dependencies, this would have looked a lot better. But um, um, 
Okay, at any rate, uh, I don't know how many of you understand uh, what, what's going on here, but a scheme is a set of attributes. In this case, the set is J, K, and L, and there are functional dependencies, uh, J and K together determine L, and L determines K. Okay. Now, clearly S is not in Boyce-Codd normal form. Uh, again, you might, I, I don't see any harm in saying clearly scheme S is not in Boyce-Codd normal form. I don't think it's a big win. I don't think it matters too much in that uh, case. Uh, unfortunately, um, they were leaving something to the reader. Uh, thing, uh, schemes are not in voice cod normal form or not in voice cod normal form. They are in or, or not depending upon the given set of functional dependencies. So uh, undoubtedly, they meant to say clearly S is not in voice cod normal form with respect to these guys. Okay, I think that they really should have said with respect to the dependencies above, even though I can figure out what they meant. Okay. Um, well, anyway, we could go on for a little, uh, a little while, and um, they make, I think, what is a, a really egregious error here. Um, okay, Boyce cut normal forms requires that all non-trivial depend dependencies of the form x arrow a. Uh, where x is a super key. Now, they neglected to define the type of A. Okay, well, there's a convention that I use in my book, which is that x, y, and z are sets of attributes, and a, b, and c are attributes. And, and evidently, that's what they meant. Okay, but they weren't thinking clearly enough about it. So, what happened, okay, they, they just neglected to describe what A was. Um, well, this is, okay, now there's, um, okay, there's a technicality. They left out the word sum here, which uh, I won't go into, but, but in fact, what they're stating is completely wrong as, as written. Uh, okay, relation scheme R is in third normal form if for all functional dependencies that hold on R of the form X arrow A. Now, already I think that that's just disgusting writing. I, I, I don't know what you've been taught in this class, but I, uh, I, I think it's just so bad that I can't even think of how to repair it. Uh, but if you can think of something, you might want to write to uh, Hank and, and, and Avi. Um, uh, at any rate, uh, by this point, we discover that A, this is A, is a member of R. So apparently, A is supposed to be of type attribute. Okay. Well. Now, on the next page, look what happens. First of all, A disappears and seems to have been replaced by Y, which by my convention is a set of attributes. Okay? Um, you see, X arrow Y is not mentioned up here. Okay? Um, well, there's X, X is a super key for Y, that's, uh, for R rather, that's, that's apparently in there. And then it says Y is contained in a, in a candidate key. So presumably Y is now a set of attributes. So I don't know what's going on here. Moreover, if you take this point literally, then they've got the definition wrong. Okay. I think they really meant for this to be A and for it to be a, a, a single attribute. So anyway, uh, and this is a book that has been published and apparently it's been selling quite well. Um, uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I think the, the point is you have to think very carefully about your types. It never hurts to, uh, to remind the reader, if for no other reason than that it will help you remind, it will help remind yourself uh, what it is you're talking about on the second pass. Um, okay, anyway, we've got more about Mr. Korth and Mr. Silvershots in, in a minute. Um, another point, I, I don't know, when I, when I took uh, freshman English in college, uh, the uh, instructor, uh, who I've been told by my wife is now the leading living American poet, uh, uh, the instructor, uh, the only thing I really remember was he drummed into us, you don't use non-referential thises. Does anybody know what a non-referential this is? Non-referential this? It's like when you say this is true or this is obvious. Oh. It's when you say something like this is true or this is obvious. Uh, yeah, basically this is either an adjective or a pronoun. People tend to use this correctly when it's an adjective. Uh, the place they have problems is when it's a pronoun. And 
yeah, when you say this is true, what you're, you're not using this as a pronoun, but rather as a, a, a place marker for some concept. Now, most of the time, I'd say probably 90% of the time, when you use that, use it that way, people will have no trouble understanding what it is that you, uh, you mean. 10% uh, of the time, uh, it really makes your writing unclear. Maybe more than 10%, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I, I have, uh, my, my only prescription, and I, I insist that my, my graduate students, when they write, that they just completely get them out of their, their writing, okay? Once you've gotten, once you're in the habit of, of having a bell go off every time you use a non-referential this, then you can start using your judgment as to whether it's clear or not. But if you don't understand that there's a problem, you're never going to be able to fix it. Sounds impressive, huh? All right. Anyway, I, I, I nailed Korth and Silver Shots again. Uh, on this. So they have to do, they do this a lot. In fact, this is what I was really looking for when I found the other example I just gave you. Because I, I happen to know that, that, that the, these two, uh, that they have them all over the place. Um, all right, this is talking about data structures of some sort. It says, the reserve space method is useful when most, most records are, are of length close to maximum. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Uh, otherwise, a significant amount of space may be wasted. Okay, another interesting idea. In our bank example, it may be the case that some branches have many more accounts than others. This leads us to consider use of the pointer method. Now, what are they talking about? Okay, I see four different ideas here, any one of which could be referred to, and it would make just as, as much sense as, as any of the others. And probably they mean, um, well, I guess I'm not sure. Uh, pr pr probably what, what they mean is that because there are some examples where um, the uh, lengths of records are not uniform, uh, it then makes sense to think about the pointer method. Well, anyway, think about how you would rewrite this paragraph uh, so that something was clear. I, maybe you, you, can, you can decide exactly what, what it is you want to say. Uh, but then re think about rewriting this so that whatever it is you felt like saying, you would, you would say. I mean, I, I think it's something like what I just said, that, that the reason you want to think about the pointer method is because in, in some real world examples, uh, record lengths can be non-uniform. Uh, okay, let's see how, how This is a 50 minute, minute class, right? Okay, that means I've got uh, 45 minutes left, oh my gosh. Uh, okay, um, anyway. Um, all right, uh, let me, um, I talk about this, this last issue of, of uh, coping with competition. Um, okay, you know, we exist in, in, you know, the book writing is a competitive sport and it's, um, uh, I think it's going to become more so. Now, uh, the, uh, okay, w one mistake that I have seen more than, than I would like is, is the following situation. You, know, you, want, you want to write a compiler book and, or well, let's, let's take another example. Um, you, you, want to, uh, you want to write a, a Pascal text. Okay, so the first thing you do is you look at what the competition's got. Okay, and um, uh, they all start out with something simple. I've seen them start out with explaining how a write statement works, uh, or how an assignment statement works, or, or, or something like that. And uh, if you're not willing to fight in the competitive market, you're going to think something like this, geez, I can't copy these books. I've got to do something different, okay? I'm going to start off with wild statements, you know? <laughs> uh, because I know nobody ever did that, and it doesn't matter. You'll eventually learn the whole language anyway, okay? And what you do is you present the book to the publisher and it's completely off the wall. Okay. Now, what I'm advising that you do, if you seriously want to go into the, the business of writing books, uh, is you understand what your market is and you, know, you understand what you are and you try to make a compromise. 
Okay? Don't avoid doing what other people have done just because they've done it. Okay? On the other hand, don't slavishly follow what other people have done uh, if you really feel you've got a better approach to things. Okay? Um, I think that, again, the mistake that people make most is, is not following the crowd when the crowd really deserves to be followed. Okay, now, uh, there's another side, of course, to that coin, which, which is um, how close can you follow the crowd or one particular cow in the uh, herd, as it were. Um, now, I have to be a little bit careful here because I want to remind you that I'm not a lawyer and that anything I say uh, should not be taken as binding on the courts. And I'm you know, quite serious that, that, that what I, I'm going to do is, is uh, skirting very close to uh, giving out unsolicited uh, legal advice. Uh, and, and I want to, again, remind you that if you are planning... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, do you, do you, know, you know where that came from? I, I have this down on my notes in big script uh, to uh, remind myself to say that. Right? I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, know, no, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know that. But, but, but the camera can't make things appear that aren't, you know, that it can't see. Uh, and if. Um, Okay. Um, anyway, okay. What? what um, okay. What is plagiarism? Okay. When? When does following the crowd uh, become plagiarism? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Any other uh, thoughts? Okay. When the, the, the suggestion was when you run for president. Uh, okay. Uh, any? Anybody have any other answers? Um, no, don't don't forget that. The, Say plagiarism is when one quotes material that someone else has written without giving credit to them. Or um, um, I, okay. In other words, plagiarism. in other words, if I say C spot run, that's plagiarism. Yes, probably. No, it's not. <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Okay. I mean, obviously, you're, you're sort of skirting the the, the issue. Uh, anyway. Um, any, any other thoughts? If their lawyers even consider taking you to court, it's, it's plagiarism. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess there is a sort of more pragmatic definition of, sort of <laughs> something you can't get away with. Uh, uh, anyway, um, so no, serious, any, any, any other shots at this? Um, okay. Uh, anyway, the, the distinction that was explained to me, and I guess I got this from a Prentice Hall Guide to Authors, uh, uh, is uh, if a reasonable person could not believe that you didn't have the other book open in front of you while you wrote yours, then it's plagiarism. Okay, see that's why C-Spot Run is not plagiarism. Okay, we all know it comes from some book or other, but I obviously spouted that extemporaneously without having the book open in front of me. Okay, it's just a well-known concept, and, uh, uh, and therefore it's, it's, not, it's not plagiarism. Um, okay, the, the important thing to remember is that you, can, you can't copyright ideas. Okay, you can only copyright expression, uh, the ways of expressing those ideas. See, um, this is why many things that look like plagiarism really aren't. Okay, uh, I mean, you know, frankly, when, like when we wrote the compiler book, we stole Dave Grease's table of contents almost exactly. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, the, he goes through the compiler from the, the front end to the back end, and we went through the compiler from the front end to the back end. Uh, again, if we, uh, it would have been a grievous error had we decided, well, if Grease goes front to back, we're going to go back to front or, or start in the middle. Uh, it just, it's just a dopey thing to do, and there's no reason why you have to do that. Um, on the other hand, uh, I know that I and my co-author, or co-authors in the recent edition, did not have Grease's book open in front of us. Okay? We probably learned something from Grease, uh, but uh, we did not, uh, 
plagiarize in the, uh, in the technical uh, sense of the term. Now, I, I just wanted to give you an example of how easy it is to pick up uh, plagiarism uh, or, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I should say that this is, I think, a, a case that looks to me v very suspicious. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> some of you may recognize this book. Uh, and by the way, this was not, uh, I did not discover this. Uh, this was actually was discovered many years ago by Al Aho. Um, there are some clues that might tell you where this is from. Uh, Okay, and I want to draw your attention to the italicized words here, okay, or the sentence. The, the such considerations suggest that we choose M to be a prime number such that R to the K is uh, con congruent to plus minus A modulo M for small k and A. Um, this is talking about, uh, about how, how big a hash table should be. M is, I guess, the size of a hash table. Okay, now here's a book that was published several years later. Um, and again, I want to uh, draw, you, draw your attention to the italicized uh, words. Is thus a good choice for M would be M, a prime number such that M does not divide R to the K plus minus A for small k and A. Uh, maybe let's try to get both of these on. Okay, now this is, this is very tricky. It's, um, first of all, in the, the later book, it says, aha, Knuth has shown. And now I would have preferred a citation uh, for that, but um, the implication is um, uh, that in, you know, there is some sort of uh, homage to uh, the previous authors being paid here. Um, I don't know, uh, I, I don't think that the, the, the coincidence of notation really is definitive because in fact if you had read Knuth's book, uh, wait, wait, this is Knuth. Okay, if you'd read if you'd read this, you might very well have remembered M, K, and A, and that way of expressing it. I don't think that that by itself uh, would be sufficient for a reasonable person to say yes. This book was open in front of the authors of that book. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, what uh, I, I think looks much more indicative or suggestive that this book was open is the italics. Okay? This is the only italicized phrase on, in this book on this page and, and likewise this is the only italicized phrase uh, in this book. They're not the same phrase but just the idea of using italics I think looks, I think it makes it much more likely that in fact this was open in front of the author of this. Okay? Again, we cannot be sure. I, I must. Yeah. 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 I, I, I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 in studying this, uh, if I come in, just I, I was, I did realize that in fact the two senses were the same. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, sorry, we're, we're opposite, yeah. okay, that there was a sign. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have no idea whether, whether this is the typo or that's the typo, but... Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I'm sorry, which, which is right? Well, it should be incongruous. Yeah, uh, 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 okay. uh, well, close enough. Um, um, all right, anyway. Uh, I, I don't, I, again, I think that this is a very close uh, decision. Uh, actually, since probably it's hard to justify any financial loss, uh, there's no point in even pursuing it. Uh, uh, Well, I, I think this was a, I mean, I mean, Jeff is using his idea of, of, of presenting only a simple example. Um, uh, if it's, if it's, it's going to be combined to a single sentence like that, I wouldn't get upset about it. But there are other cases where the guy goes on a sequence of 12 equations in a row in the same order, uh, you know, different words. But, but it's, it's clear that the whole idea of the exposition and so on was, was ripped off. That, that's uh, uh, not very cool. <laughs> Jeff? Um, in, in the second edition of the Dragon Book, I noticed that uh, you know large phrases of it were lifted verbatim from the first edition of the Dragon Book, and I was wondering if you would uh, 
give us some, some insight into extra editions. Oh, if it's your own words. No, 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 not in terms of plagiarism, unfortunately. So okay. it just meant to be a bad segue there. But uh, just in terms of the dynamics of doing a second edition and, again, the sales, what, you know, what does the sales curve do, things like that. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, well, uh, I think the Dragon Book was a fairly substantial rewrite. I think the things that we felt we did right in the first edition um, didn't change too much. Um, uh, we got a lot of leverage from using the same examples. Well, we had thought out good examples. Remember, examples, design of examples is a big part of writing the book. And so you can, things will go a lot faster in the second edition if, in fact, you can use your examples. If it turns out that your examples aren't very good or you really have to get into new ground and, and write new text and, and do new examples, then it's, it's just like writing a new book. Um, I'm sorry, as far as the, the financial advantages of, of writing a new book, uh, of, of, sorry, doing a second edition, um, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're real. Uh, you know, a, a rough rule of thumb is a book has a five-year lifetime. That is, uh, you know, sort of, you, you're best off thinking of, sa of this, your sales curve as, as looking like this. Uh, okay, where this is you know, <laughs> zero, five. Now, in, in actual fact, it will probably look more like this, but, but, but this is a good approximation to what's going on. Okay, so that means that after five years, if you uh, start writing a new edition, that's probably a, sen a sensible thing to do. Um, and if you can't think of any ways to improve it, then let somebody else write the improved book. And actually, about, I mean, what does that thousand hours figure turn into for a second edition? Let's say something on the order of the Dragon Book, re the, the second edition of the Dragon Book. A what? thousand hours to write it. What did that turn into for the second edition? Uh, I'm sorry, turn into for what? Oh, oh, the, oh. How long did it take you to do the second oh, edition do, of the Dragon Book? Uh, I'm not sure, but I would assume we each put in about a thousand hours. I mean, that was enough, enough rewritten, and in fact, it's an 800 page book. So that's. You know, and since that, an 800-page book, is, I think it was actually 2.3 megabytes, uh, the new Dragon Book. So that's, um, if we each put in 1,000 hours, we were really doing very well. Uh, okay, because that's, that's really not a typical sized book. Uh, I have a plagiarism question. Um, let's say that you're writing, you're writing something, you're writing just a, a survey of things, and you've got a whole bunch of different papers in front of you, and you find that different people said different things about it, they're all interesting, and you want to sort of pull in lots of things that lots of people said, and you find that they use some nice phrases to describe these things, and you want to use those phrases. Can you, can you do that as long as you're not following the same development that they followed? Well, again, I'm, okay, first of all, yeah, uh, right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's very tricky. First of all, if you're writing a survey, then you are presumably not even attempting to uh, advertise the, sort, the thoughts as your own. Uh, you presumably are going to be giving attribution uh, to, uh, uh, to each of the, the authors that you're, sur you're surveying. Um, I would say that the same, um, uh, you know, the same rules apply in that if you want to use their phrases, if you want to have the, uh, their papers open in front of you as you write, which, which seems to be the sensible way to write a survey, um, uh, you know, then you should put quotes around the words that you copy. Okay. You can have, a, you, remember, you can have their book, uh, I'm sorry, m maybe in fact I did not make myself clear. It's not having a, someone else's book or paper open in front of you that's illegal. It's the combination of having it open in front of you and having their words or their expressions uh, appear in your work that... Uh, but, no. but your work is going to seem very awkward if every, you know, so many... If you're reading um, along and then all of a sudden there's, there's like the next six words are in quotes and you're reading along and the next five words are in well, quotes. Well, um, the, the... Um, you know, uh, again, you, you, you've got... Um, well, okay, if, okay, point number one is if, if what you're doing is surveying technical papers. There's no money in technical papers anyway, so there's no, there's no loss. I mean, plagiarism, I believe, is a civil matter rather than a criminal matter. 
uh, in order for them to get you know to get you, they have to you have to argue they have to argue that that you have caused them financial loss. If all they've done is written a technical paper, um, there's no yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, there's nothing that they can say that you've taken from them. Uh, on the other hand, you still do have basic issues of, of you know, you should not take large segments of other people's writing and, and uh, uh, pawn, it, uh, pawn it off as your own. Um, uh, I think maybe, again, and, and you know, I must preface the I'm not a lawyer bit, that, that uh, you know, maybe if in fact you want to use six words at a time from their sentences, you probably can just do it without worrying too much. Um, that seems like a kind of far-fetched situation, though. I mean, I, I would imagine either you're going to just write things the way you want to, or you know, you just you know say uh, Joe Jones says the following about uh, whatever uh, quote. Will your parallel computation book be completed? Uh, it's not clear that it ever will. Uh, I uh, am waiting for this. This is, I guess, another point about co-authorship. Uh, you should uh, find co-authors that are really committed to, to getting the thing done. I mean, you shouldn't spend more than a year on anything. Uh, sorry, Don. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, if you can't do it in a year, it's out of date anyway, so uh, uh, by and large. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think you have to be a little bit careful. Um, can you give me an example of a useful analogy in computer science? No, 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 no. I, I know about the, uh, at least I used to know about the physics ones. I mean, uh, something in computer science that is a useful analogy. I mean, a computer is like a what? Um, if you're sure that your reader understands the analogy, I mean, like I used to once, I once knew what tensors were, but I've forgotten. Uh, if I, you know, if I just say, you know, if I'm trying to explain um, teach Pascal or something, and I say, hey, you all know what tensors are, uh, you know, and it's just not going to work. Uh, you have to be very sure that your readers understand things. I think the nice thing about physics is you take some complicated things that, that are not tangible. You know, uh, you can't really see uh, oscillating currents in a wire, but you can say, hey, it's like a spring. And everybody's seen a spring and knows how springs work. Excuse me. Uh, yes? Um, there's another class waiting to come in. Oh, OK. <laughs> oh, fine. Well, thank you. Um,